Welcome to Sparks of History, where Jewish history and world history meet. We are extremely pleased to have with us today Dr. David Sklar. Dr. Sklar earned his doctorate at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, and Dr. Sklar has held fellowships at numerous universities and institutions, including Harvard University, the University of Oxford, University of Toronto, New York University, and the Center for Jewish History. Dr. Sklar is a postdoctoral research associate and lecturer with the program in Judaic Studies at Princeton University. And Dr. Sklar has written on a wide range of topics covering Jewish thought and Jewish history. Dr. Sklar recently edited the Golden Path, Maimonides Across Eight Centuries, which features highlights from the Hartman family collection of manuscripts and rare books. And uh, it's currently a Yeshiva University Museum exhibition, which opened May 9th and runs until the end of the year. And as you can see, and as we'll see later, it's just a, it's a wonderful, beautiful, beautifully put together a uh, book with uh, manuscripts and essays, and um, uh, we'll get right to it. Um, Maimonides, the Rambach. Thank you again, Dr. Sklar, for uh, your time today. We appreciate it very much. Thank you. Um, just to start off, the major opposition to Maimonides, the Rambam, during his lifetime, and how did that opposition, generally speaking, develop after his lifetime? So <clears throat> I think it's probably best to start in terms of the Rambam, understanding how impactful he was. Um, so he lived between 1138 and 1204, always within an Islamic context. He was born in Cordoba, uh, went to Fez under duress, family possibly, if not probably, converted to Islam for a short time. Um made his way ultimately the last three and a half decades of his life. He was in Fastat, which is considered now old Cairo. Um, and he was coming out of Spain. He was a philosopher. Um, he was the descendant and sort of the scion of a very great rabbinic family. Um, in fact, he lists something like eight. When he, when he signs his name at one point, the, the list, um, Eight predecessors, his father, grandfathers, and such, all of whom, or most of whom, were Dayanim, um, judges, that is. So, And he saw himself as this um, exceptional individual, which, of course, he was. Now, one of the things that he did, besides um, coming out of the own, his own Islamic and specifically Spanish con uh, context of um, using, appreciating, even idealizing Aristotle and rationalism, was that he saw himself as essentially when it came to rabbinic Judaism as producing or the the having the ability and the capacity to produce a sort of um, a total understanding of what Judaism was and is. So he manifested this in this great work, the Mishnah Torah, which of course took him 10 years to, to produce. Uh, and it itself became controversial for a number of reasons. One was... Uh, philosophical concepts that he used, his devotion to Aristotle and the idea that ultimately you can use Aristotle uh, and philosophy, that is, uh, to meld it with traditional Judaism, to the understanding of the Torah. Now, what this involved, of course, was a rational understanding of things, which meant that if you have something that sounds fantastical, um, sounds like a miracle, an open miracle, then really perhaps, or prophecy as an example, really is something that would have been uh, conveyed in a dream rather than something, you know, as if the laws of nature changed. So this itself was controversial in his own time, meaning within rabbinic Judaism. Uh, his adherence and his ultimately his, the pro the, his production of his own philosophical worldview was manifested most brilliantly and extremely complex, com complexly in the Marin of Uchim, the Guide of the Perplex, which he wrote between 1186 and 1190 or 1191. Um, so that's one, and that was hugely influential. So philosophy was one aspect that was controversial even during his own time. But going back to the Mishnah Torah and the idea that he is sort of can provide a, a one-stop shop for what is Jewish law and ritual and life, um, 
what he did there was some people, I think, in general, will, will understand it as though he he saw it as replacing the Talmud. I don't think that's exactly what he was doing, but certainly for the vast majority of people, they were the, the intention was that they could consult the Mishnah Torah rather than attempting to engage with the Talmud. Because I think from from the Rambam's point of view, people didn't actually understand what was what the Talmud was in its back and forth discussion, but frequently. Uh, where it did not actually resolve an issue. So what he was doing with the Mishnah Torah was actually to resolve issues as he saw them. But what he did when he produced it was to do two major things that uh, make it easy to to study, but also were hugely controversial from a rabbinic point of view. One was his methodology. He didn't really articulate a methodology. So that meant that when he was deciding on a halachic concept and ultimately on a legal principle, we don't know exactly what he was doing. Where, did, How did he reach this conclusion as, a, as an example? Now, I already mentioned philosophy, but the second aspect, um, one was methodology, and the second thing related to methodology is that he ultimately didn't cite his sources. So the lack of citation and the issue of methodology and the inclusion of philosophy were all controversial issues that were immediately taken up specifically with the, the Ravad, the Ravid, um, Abraham ben David of Pesquier, so he was from Provence, and Ashkenazic scholars in general at that time, and then certainly in the following generations, found this to be um, problematic, to say the least. Now, of course, it was, he, the Rambam was such a great figure, and he was so profound, and the Mishnah Torah was so profound, that even for those who didn't like it, and like what he was doing, they had to essentially address it. Um, the opposition to this continued. There is traditionally an understanding of, based on traditional sources of those who were defending the Rambam in the time, in the 13th century. So I mentioned that he died in 1204, that his writings were actually burned, um, like specifically the Rambam's writings were burned possibly by Jews. There's recent scholarship that challenges this notion. Certainly the Rambam's writings were burned like many other rabbinic texts in Paris in 1242, and then later in the 16th century uh, in Italy. But regardless, you didn't need Jews to burn their own texts, in essence, for it to be a controversy. It did continue. Uh, famously, there was a ban on philosophy that the Rashba uh, instituted. The ban specifically at that time, this was 1235, I think, uh, was really about what age people could study philosophy. Um, and the Rambam, in essence, epitomized this issue of what it meant to study and engage with with philosophy. Um, so that's sort of a very long-winded explanation in terms of what the opposition was. It continued, but I think the important point is to, is to recognize that even though there was opposition, um, everyone had to contend with the fact that the Rambam had produced what he did, meaning he was that authoritative of a figure.